Good morning, Journey. Whether you're joining us online or you're in the room, we are so glad that you decided to join us this morning. We're going to start with some worship, so will you please stand on your feet and sing with us. this morning. Grace 
Hey, can we give it up one more time for our worship team? Man, they are killing it this morning. You guys, there's a line in that song that says, our heart overflows. And I absolutely, 100% right now know that the presence of God is pushing that forward in this service and even online. Thank you for joining us. So you guys, uh, my name is Brian. I'm our Connections Director here at Journey. And we are just so thankful for you're here. So this is gonna be a great service. We've got some things coming up that I wanna tell you about. So the first thing coming up is first step. It's actually two 
day. It's at 1230 in the corner room. It's a great time to get to know the heart and the DNA points of this church. Uh, there's lunch, there's free childcare. We would love to have you there. I'll be there, so of course you want to come. Uh, the next thing coming up is the Bunny Hop Trail. You guys, this is an event where the entire church can come together. Whether you've got kids or grandkids or great grandkids or no kids, it doesn't matter. We would love to have you there volunteering. And even what we're doing is we're collecting uh, candy. So if you, next time you're on campus, bring a bag of candy or you can go on the church website and go on the Amazon wish list. Um, yeah, it's going to be a great event. The next thing coming up, I cannot wait until he's here. He's a good friend of Journey. Let's just clap it up that he's even coming. This is awesome. Chris Gore is such an amazing guy. This is going to be a great healing workshop. You do not want to miss this. So make sure you get signed up. Go on the church website or, or head to the lobby for more information after service. Um, and lastly, you guys, there is so much going on on this campus, locally and globally. And we would love if you guys could partner with us. The impact that you make each and every Sunday or Friday, whatever it is, by giving, it's huge. So we just love you guys and we thank you and just continue to partner with us. That's, that's amazing. So let me pray and then we'll keep worshiping. Father God, we just thank you for today. Thank you for putting breath in our lungs. And thank you so much for the opportunity to serve your kingdom. So God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit starts to move this morning, whether we're online or in the building, God. Just open our ears, open our hearts, and we love you in your son's name. Amen.
Let's just, um, before our team uh, goes off the stage, let's just say that. Uh, just say to the Lord, close your eyes and just say, Lord, you have spoken. When, say it usually requires noise. Lord, you have spoken and I know that it is so. Say it again. Lord, you have spoken and I know that it is so. Now think about all the crud and storms and opposition and sickness and estrangement coming against you and your friends and your family. Just feel the divine steel going through your spine and just say, Lord, you have spoken. Say, Lord, you have spoken, and I know that it is so. All right. You know, that's, this song is like the, it's, 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 it's the life with Christ. It's like, it's what it means when the Bible says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We, we don't say, okay, well, all right, now that I've seen that, I guess I'll take a step and believe. You know that's not it, right? You, you step and, and then you know, because God's word is more real than anything you're going through. The, the cement under your feet that feels so solid, for those of you here, or whatever, if you're at home, whatever your floor's made out of, wood or cement, the word of God is more real and more solid than that. In the beginning, God said, and there was that that's kind of that's the pattern for life god says and then there is so whatever you need to believe god for we're going to just kind of maybe do a couple more lines of this chorus and 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 i want you to sing it but i but I, but i want us to in our to just start begin to do it begin to believe it begin to go get it does that make sense right now, whether, whatever it is that you're seeking God for. Because we know the direction this is going, right? We, we know that his kingdom is unshakable. And so things are always going towards your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as if heaven had already arrived. So whatever in your life does not look like heaven, go come against that and let's bring heaven, get as much heaven in our lives as possible. Does that make sense? You guys at home, if you're at home and you're sitting on your couch, stand up. Stand up with us, all right? Those of us in the room. So, uh, so let's just let's run through this just a little more, and uh, let's go get something, all right? So can you guys just do one more for us or a little bit more?
Yeah, 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 yeah. Before you sit down, uh, turn around and say hi to a few people around you. Make sure there's no strangers. Hey, Matt, can you drag that thing over here? All right, there, that's perfect. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Mi nombre es Ed, and uh, glad, to, glad to have you here. And uh, if you're at home, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. And uh, thanks for being with us today. And yeah. So next weekend, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a big weekend for us. Our friend uh, Chris Gore is going to be here. And Chris is an amazing guy. He's written four or five books. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's got, like, he's done tons of thinking about about praying for healing and, and how God heals and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's really going to be awesome. But not only thinking, but, I mean, God's just used him to do a lot of cool stuff. His story's fantastic and amazing. And he's just a great human. I've gotten to know him, and uh, he's a great and godly guy. So here's how the next weekend looks. First of all, don't miss next weekend. Duh, right? Don't miss. Whatever plans you have that could cost you to miss them, miss next weekend, cancel those and plan to be here. That's what you need to do. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, so Chris will be here in the services, in all three services. And in part of the service, um, you know, like we do every week, but just kind of we'll kick it up a notch. We're really going to just pray for people and have our prayer team ready to really pray. And and we'll be talking about that kind of thing. And so um, here's what I would do. I would make sure you're here. Then I would invite anybody that you think would go, yeah, they, that would be really cool. And then um, especially anybody that you know that, that they or somebody in their family really needs a touch from God, a healing touch from God, I would bring them. If you have a friend that is, say, I'm not saying we're going to like, you know, uh, have all sick people healed next weekend. Maybe, yeah, why not, right? Um, but that's not the point. The point is, if people need hope, this, this is a weekend to, to come. And uh, Chris has been here. This will be his third time here. We just, he's just an amazing cat. Now, the other thing is that um, on Saturday, he's going to give us his morning and, uh, like, train people, like, how to take your prayer game up a notch, and uh, this isn't for just like super advanced, you know, just for our prayer team, our people that do our after service prayer team or stuff. This is just for all of us. Like it's a thing on like how to do life with God and how to experience, you know, the power of God flowing through you in your everyday life. So it, it's a great use of your Saturday morning. So I think what, what we would like to do is have you sign up in advance so we can manage uh, which room the thing is in. Does that make sense? Like right now we plan to have it, I think, in the plaza room, but if it, there's too many people, we'll move it somewhere, you know, because of all the, the stuff with space limitations and stuff. We just want to make sure that we have enough space. It, probably we will take you as if you're just walking in that day, but it would help us if you sign up in advance. All right, good. Nod your heads. Go, yeah, I get it. All right, good. So... Don't miss next weekend. It's going to be epic. It's an epic, epic time. So, yeah. And then, um, oh, by the way, if you want to do lunch today, um, 
come back after the next service and we'll do first step right out in Tentosaurus out there. It's going to be fun. And uh, if you've never done first step, that's kind of our, like, here's what this church is. This is the, you know, lift the hood and look at the engine kind of like, what, what, what's really going on here? Like, uh, what, like what, what kind of church is this? And stuff like that. So <laughs> nothing bad. Some of you are like, what? yeah, now that you mention it, what, what is this place? Well, we'll answer that question. And worst case scenario, you get a free lunch. All right. So uh, yeah. We good? You're kind of quiet. I just, I, I don't like it when you're quiet. So, um, and uh, oh, I, I might as well say something about this. Um, for uh, the, everything is re-rolling here at Journey in, a, in its kind of whatever, to the maximum way we can do stuff right now, and then maybe a little beyond that. And, uh, but the one area that we haven't been able to redo is our zero to two year old like stuff. Like you, if you have a zero to two, um, we don't have nursery because you know, you can't social distance an infant, right? And uh, I, I, you could, but it's really not good for them. But uh, the, uh, the deal is, so you're totally welcome to bring your kids in here. And we'll just deal, right? If your kid goes a little nuts, we'll just deal. We, we don't care, right? We're, that's why we get these cement floors. Your kids can puke on the floor or uh, whatever they need to do, you know, which is, there's so many millions of times when I'm like, I am so glad we didn't put a carpet down on this thing. So uh, that's one of them. So, but, um, so yeah, just the rest of us, like, right? I, you don't mind if some kid's crawling all over you, right? You'll, you'll deal. So uh, I'm excited. Bring them in. So, uh, so here's the deal. We're finishing our joy series today, kind of sadly uh, for me. But um, uh, this, if we need to get some more joy in here. This world needs joy. There's, there's, a, there's like a march of depression and bad news. And, uh, you know, I actually saw somebody talking about how their therapist urged them to stop watching the news, right? Now, they could have been one of those people that obsess and have pushes on their phone and all this stuff. But there's this march of bad news. And, and see, what's happening is it's undermining people's joy because most people, most of us, our strategy to be happy, our strategy to manage our life, the, the way that we plan to be happy is this. I hope things go well. And then if things go well, I'll be doing well and I'll be happy. But it doesn't take a genius all it takes is one step back to look at that and go, wait, that's not going to work, <laughs> right? Because like at least, but what, 30% of the time, 40%, things aren't going well, right? Whether they're ba- little, like there can be a whole lot of little things that don't go well, and then it's like, ah, I'm bummed out. Or there can be one big honking thing that doesn't go well, right? A really bad thing. And then it doesn't matter if the little things are doing well, because this this one, like a tragedy or a loss in your life. So enter the Bible book called Philippians. And that's what we've been looking at the last few weeks. And it's, it's the perfect book for uh, times like these, when things feel out of control, when, when joy seems hard to come by, when, like, when the, 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 you know, the normal props that we have for happiness aren't, get swept out from under us and they don't work anymore. So here's the, why this is the perfect book. It's, it's only four pages, like in most Bibles, maybe five. But, and you can read it or listen to it in, what, 10, 12 minutes, something like that? Uh, 12, 13 at the most. And, and here's the deal. In four pages, the word joy is used 17 times. And here's why it's perfect. It's written from jail. Jail. Not and that and third world jail, right? And third world first century jail. And so if Paul can be like the, if, if a connection with God can can get you full of joy in jail, then maybe maybe it'll work for us. So here's let's uh, I'm going to show you a few verses, and then here's the here's what I would do is I would use the Journey app to get your outline on your phone or use the paper outline. And then if you have the paper outline, you can also have like use, there's, a, there's an app you should have on your phone called YouVersion, Y-O-U, version, And it has 
Bible, every translation you can imagine of the Bible, and it's free, and it's awesome, and you can look up Philippians chapter 3. That's, I'll be reading out of that. Some of it will be on the, on the screen, not as much as usual, but just, just maybe that will keep you. So Paul, like he's halfway through the book, and he's wrapping it up, like, just like me. Like he says, okay, in conclusion, and then you know you're like halfway done, right? It's like, so Paul says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That's, that's his like middle of the, he said, let, let me just sum this up. Now he's going to talk about joy about 10 more times after this, but he says, all right, let me sum up my whole point. My whole point is that God has joy for us. And the point of this thing is joy. It's about Jesus and it's about joy. And if you can stay connected with him, you can, you can stay in joy. I'll read the rest of you in a second. Here, here's... Here's something we've got to redo in our heads a little bit. We need to remember that God is the joy guy. That, that joy and God are, are this, that's the deal. We've, the great uh, PR move the devil's ever made is to like somehow convince us that the devil is the fun guy and God God's like that guy. Do you remember when you were like in junior high and you'd get, uh, your parents would drop you off at, uh, at the, at the putt-putt golf place? Did you guys call it that? Putt-putt. And it's like you can play mini golf and they had arcade games. And then the best thing, of course, but it cost you the most money, was you could get tickets to ride the go-karts. Remember that? And when you're like 11 or 12, like driving something is just like, oh, yeah. Maybe this is a male thing. I don't know. But I mean, it's just driving a go-kart, you're like, this is going to be so cool if all your friends are there and you're planning to like do imitation NASCAR. And, you know, and then there's the, then there's the, the grown-up who now you're looking back is probably like 17, right? Who's standing there and he's usually got his foot on the on the one of the front go kart, and he's the guy. Basically, his job is to ruin your fun. All right, uh, no no passing each other, no bumping into each other. Like well, that's why we're here to bump into each other, right? And uh, if your cart spins out, don't get out of the car. And you know, he's the guy to just stand there and ruin it for you. And I think a lot of us think, yes, that's God. God's the guy, you got life going, and you're like, oh, man, life's going to be awesome. And God says, all right, before you get going, okay, none of this, none of that, none of, none, none of these. And, you know, anything you like and it feels good, you can't do that, you know. And, uh, oh, you like doing that? Oh, you like that, don't you? Forget it. You can't do it. Like, that's, here's, God's the joy guy. I, I was reading in my, um, my personal my personal quiet time, as if, as if I read this secret personal quiet. But I was reading the Bible for myself, not work. And I was, just happened to be, I use this Bible reading plan. Morgan referred to it. Love for you to be in on that. But uh, it, this Friday, Friday I think it was, it had me in the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is Moses' last book. It's the second Deutero, second giving of the law. And th it's the summary. They're like literally on the shore of the Jordan River. They're about to go take the promised land. Moses is about to die. And he's saying, all right, I'm going to sum this up for you. This, I'm, like 40 years of history and five, you know, several hundred, four or five hundred years before that. I'm going to sum up the whole point of this thing. There's been dozens and dozens, some say 613 laws that led to that moment. And Moses goes, all right, here's the deal. I have commandments that we're going to keep, keep, hook, like, like statutes and ordinances. So in, in right in the middle of the book, he says, now, in summary, we're going to tithe. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's tough. And he goes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our tithe. And some of you are going to, and when you get in the land, God's going to pick a place that is the worship spot. Now, eventually it would be Jerusalem, but they didn't know that. He goes, and if where you end up living is too far to take livestock because you're t they didn't it wasn't money it was an agrarian they had money but there was it was mostly an agrarian society so when you tithe your sheep for example if you if your flock increased a hundred sheep over the year you brought ten of them and offered them to the Lord just tithe right does that make sense nod your head yeah but if you lived like 
Say you lived way up by the Sea of Galilee, and it's too far to carry 10 sheep on a three days, four day walk. Here's what you do. Here, listen, this is, this is God summing it up. All right, so what you do is you sell those sheep for money. You put the money securely away. You go to Jerusalem, and then here's what it says in Deuteronomy 14. Then you may spend the money for whatever your heart desires. Whatever your soul wants, spend the money on that. Oxen, sheep, wine, beer, whatever. And it's in there, strong drink, that's what that means. What, don't shoot the messenger, ladies. All right, so... Uh, but uh, whatever your heart desires, there you shall eat it in the presence of the Lord your God. And here's the commandment. And rejoice, you and your household. God commanding us to party in his presence. What do you like? You like steak? You want a big, fat, juicy steak? All right. Well, you'd fine. I got fires going all the time in this temple. It's a constant barbecue. Just throw that bad boy on there. Don't overcook it. You know, that's right in the next verse. And uh, I'm just kidding. And it's like, you like lamb, you want like a, some asobuco or something like that. Whatever you want. Isn't that crazy? God's the guy telling people, whatever your soul wants, that's what I want you to bring into the temple. Your only stipulation is invite me to the party. God is the joy guy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, the Bible says, which is why the devil is always working against your joy. Always. How, you might ask. It'd be cool if you actually asked that, but uh, how, you might ask, right? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Here is the last thing Paul's going to talk about. It's the, the safeguard. How is, God, how is the devil working against your joy? By the the great underminer, yes, I know there's no such word as underminer. The great underminer of joy is this thing called toxic religion. Believe it or not, where the devil is most, the thing the devil is mostly doing is trying to get you to be more religious. Isn't that weird? Why would he do that? Because he is working against your joy and one of the most effective things against joy is this thing called toxic religion. And there's a, and Paul's going to talk about this when he talks about joy this last time for us, he's going to talk about the, the, I guess this is germane, like the vaccine against toxic religion. The, the thing that'll protect you from toxic religion is this thing called grace. Paul's going to talk about grace. This of all these messages, this is probably the most important, but, but in a weird way, it's the, it's the hardest one to really get. And so we'll see how, how it goes. See, toxic religion is the great underminer of joy, and the antidote and the protection and the vaccine is this thing called grace. Now, when it comes to toxic religion, here's... Think with me, all right? Just, you know, just think with me. It's not, toxic religion is not just practiced by religious people. People who would call themselves religious. Part of my working theory is there's no such thing as non-religious people. There's just people that do their religion with traditional religion and people that are just making it up as they go. See, stay with me. And see if you, if you found this to be true in, in, in your experience. All of us humans, we leverage ultimate things to feel good about ourselves. We, we connect ourselves with, with ultimate things, ideas, uh, absolute things, in order to feel good about ourselves. Not, not just good, but to feel superior. It's not enough for us to feel okay about ourselves. Us humans, here's what we tend to do, is we try to leverage ultimate things mentally. We leverage ultimate things so we can feel superior. That's part of our like happiness strategy. Stay with me here if you're going, I don't know what you're talking about. Hold on a second. See, 
we need to not just feel, in order to be happy, we need to not just feel like things are okay. We have to feel, and here's a word that most people wouldn't use this word, but here's what it is, right? We need to feel like we are righteous. Everybody, even people that don't use that word, people that have never gone to church and don't go to church and don't like church or think they don't like church. All of, all of us humans need, see, God embedded this in Imago Dei people. This is in you whether you like it or not. You have a need to feel righteous, like you're a, a righteous person. Um, and the thing is, so that's why very close to the original sin, like there's whatever the original sin is, like in the Garden of Eden, like mm, the very next the very next thing that happened was humans trying to justify themselves and judge other people. If you read Genesis where they eat the fruit, you know, and, and do that, the first thing that happened, the very, boom, the next thing out in the concentric circle is justifying themselves, feel like they have to feel righteous, and then throwing somebody else under the bus, judging others. We can't just be happy like just, that's why pleasure, everybody knows this, pleasure is not the path to happiness. Pleasure is great, all right? But it's, you, if you surrender to pleasure, you end up addicted and broken and a mess. We all know that, right? Some of us do it anyways because it's like, it's all we've got. But it's not, everybody knows that. Every, we all kind of know that, right? See, it's not enough to just have pleasure. We have to justify ourselves. We have to feel like we're a good person, like we're righteous. Some people, now follow me here, you can totally see how people use religion to do that. Some people think that is what religion is, is it's, you use it in order to be like, make up for your faults, be a good person, and, and judge other people. You have a place, a perch to stand on to look down on others. A lot of people think that's what religious people are all about, and maybe they're right. But here's the thing. Non-religious people do that also because we all have to feel like we're a good person. I, I, here's an example. I think this will work. I was thinking about this. When I was a kid slash teenager, there was a huge cultural figure by the name of Hugh Hefner, right? And uh, our boy Hugh uh, was like living a life that at the time felt outrageous and immoral, right? There was, those words were used about him. He's like Playboy magazine and he had the Playboy mansions and the Playboy jet and the, and the clubs and all this stuff. And so here's the interesting thing, at least in my formative years, he, dude was not, here's what was different about our boy Hugh. He wasn't back in some corner doing this stuff, spending all day in his jammies. You know what I mean? It's like he wasn't back there. He was like, he was out there on talk shows and in articles and not just in like, like in intellectual magazines and stuff. They were, he was discussing this and basically, he was tr defending himself and explaining wh how what the average person in the culture at the time said, this guy is an immoral slime. He says, no, I'm not. To the contrary, I'm the one who's a righteous person. I'm the one. And he spent tons of time justifying himself. Look, it's not... It's not me, it's the whole culture that's wrong. That's what he said. If, you, if you're old enough to remember that, that was his basic argument, right? Christianity, that was his point. That's the problem. Not me with my, you know, thing that I'm doing here. And so, so if even that guy feels the need to justify himself, well, it's a human thing, right? So let me show you the next... Well, let's go back to the verse. Can you guys throw Philippians 3, 1 up there? So Paul says, okay, finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. God's the joy guy. Stay with God and you'll have joy. 
Now, now he's going to get into something that, frankly, unless you dig a little bit, you're not going to, it's almost impossible to know what he's talking about because it's like very specific to that moment. If you read the Bible, you'd know, but if you're new, you wouldn't. So he says this, to write the same things, again, is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard from you. So I'm going to safeguard your joy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you how to guard your joy. And so here's the thing. Uh, here's the next verse that he says. Now, you're, this isn't going to be on the screen, so you just have to listen. He says this, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. You're like, What? Yeah, okay, you sh- <laughs> unless you already have a Bible background, there's no way you would know what he's talking about. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Here's what that means. Paul says, there are people trafficking in toxic religion out there. And there's the nature of toxic religion is to feel superior and to try to bring other people into its misery. It's the very nature of this. So watch out because in every single church ever in the history of everything, it is, it is tried to seep in. To every person that's ever tried to follow Jesus ever, this every single one, they have had to fight this particular battle. If you say to yourself, well, I'm following Jesus and I've never had to fight this battle. That means you've already lost the battle because you're just like already in the wash there. And Paul says, so he says, these, it's like we're the ones who put no confidence in the flesh. Now, here's what I'm going to do my best to explain that to you. All right. Toxic religion in this moment in the history of the church and Christ followers looked like this. Here's Paul who is a, a uh, orthodox, now they didn't have these terms then, but I'm putting them in today's terms. Is a, in Israel, they have this cult, there's orthodox Jews, and then they have ultra-orthodox Jews. And if you've ever seen pictures of the wall, uh, the, the Western Wall, or have seen pictures in Israel of dudes with the funny hats, the massive beards, always wearing black with white shirts, and uh, davening, this, you know when they pray this thing? It's called davening. Yes, anybody ever? Am I, you guys not read the paper? All right, so uh, it, it's those, mostly that's ultra-Orthodox Jewish guys. They're from various parts of the world, which is why the hats and stuff are slightly different. But um, the deal is, in these, back in these days, it was just a matter of how serious you are. Paul was uber-serious. He was a rabbi. He was trained by the greatest rabbi of the day, a guy named Gamaliel. Um, he was the two, th- three more generations. There was a great rabbi called Akiba that I might talk about. But uh, so Paul is, he's serious. He is serious about this. And somehow, and the, the story's in Acts 9, on his way, because he was so serious about this, he saw this. Yeshua, this Jesus is the Messiah movement as a threat to, to true Judaism. And so he was, him and some of the guys who were involved in trying to make sure Jesus got crucified, he was, in, he was like trying to stomp this out on his way to a city in Syria called Damascus to, to further that cause, he met Jesus. It's a... It, um, it's a story Brooke Lee referred to that when she preached here a few weeks ago. And he meets Jesus and has this radical turnaround. And it takes him two years of his life to just kind of figure out what the heck happened to him, right? And so now, one of the callings on his life is for him, this uber-Jewish guy, to take the message of Jesus to us non-Jewish people. And he has to figure out, well, what does that look like? What does it look like for a, a former Zeus worshiper you know, or Apollo worshiper or whatever we were to, to become a follower of the one true God through the Messiah, Jesus. So Paul, Paul's running around with this message to us non-Jews. I'm assuming most of us here are not Jewish. That God has sent the Messiah of Israel who actually is the Lord of the world and the Savior of the world to restore us. That he died a humiliating death even on a cross, and he rose victoriously. And now, because of him, there is hope. 
There's hope for everything in your life. And there's joy. And a joy that doesn't just depend on things going well. And if Paul is saying, if you'll simply trust him and turn to him, he'll give you relationship with God as a gift. And he'll make you righteous as a gift. And you'll have eternal life. Yay, right? You can imagine how people receive this. Because, you know, this Zeus worship, you're thinking, well, they were probably, you know, the happy natives just sitting there. No, they weren't. They're as miserable as us. And so they hear this noise, then they hear this message, and they're like, oh, yeah. Paul says, listen, now, we Jews, we got the first crack at this thing. And so we had to turn from our weird religious stuff, the ways we've distorted it, even though we had revelation from God. Now you guys, you Gentiles, you get to join for free because of the Messiah. Trust him, turn to him, and you're in. God forgives you. He makes you righteous. Come on in. Like Paul said in one place, therefore, having been justified by faith, well, you can have peace with God. Yay. Nothing but aces, right? Green lights. It's awesome. There were these people. And so people were turning to Jesus and forming churches everywhere in the Roman Empire through Paul and his team. But then there were these people that in, in the... If you read, uh, if you study this in the field of New Testament studies, they're often called uh, Judaizers. They were people that would come to these churches after they started, and they would kind of look like they'd have tefillim, you know, the, the, the Jewish garbs, that maybe they'd be wearing on a kippah, you know, these things here on the head, and they'd be um, maybe, you know, have a talit around their, you know, the prayer shawl and stuff. And people go, whoa, this dude is serious about it. Wow, that's cool. T tell me more about this. Because part of what they had in their churches was maybe one of the Old Testament scrolls and some things that Paul had told them. And they go, oh, yeah, this Paul's, yeah, Paul's cool and all, but um, he didn't tell you. If you really want to, some, some of them were saying this, if you really want to be in, you know, you got you to gotta get in, you got to get down with the Jewish stuff, man. Like, you guys are all circumcised, right? No, Paul didn't say anything about that. What? Pardon me? He didn't say anything about circumcision? Huh. Well, let me show you here in Genesis. It says, right, Abraham, you got to be circumcised. So he says it right there, see? And, and, and they're like, oh. Yeah, and uh, hey, at that, that potluck, I noticed there was a ham there. <laughs> How do you think God feels about that, Right? He made those pigs delicious but deadly. And it's like, uh, <laughs> there, there's a, in The Simpsons, there's this, uh, there's this guy named Troy McClure character, and he does like uh, school films, safety films. And he goes, you might know me from my other documentary, Lead Paint, Delicious but Deadly. <laughs> and he's like, uh, but I'm sorry. So uh, can we erase that from the live stream? Let's not get that on it. And Paul is like, and some of them went as far as to say, oh, there's no way you're going to heaven if you don't keep the law. If you don't get circumcised, do you think there's going to be a bunch of guys and uncircumcised dudes in heaven? And they're like, uh, I never thought of that, actually. And he's like, oh, there's not, right? <laughs> so Paul's like, these dudes are nuts. You got to watch out for these guys. It's toxic religion. And you can already feel how it kills joy, right? It's a joy killer. And the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? It leads people away from Jesus and what Jesus was talking about. You'll notice in that little spiel I did that there's nothing about Jesus, how all of a sudden the cross doesn't seem to make as much sense because now I got to do all this, you know, law keeping stuff. And it's like today, you know, people going around saying, you know, God's cool, it's nice that he loves you and forgives you and all, but, uh, you know, there's fine print. You know, you got to read the whole Bible. There's stuff in there that, like, uh, you know, don't think this is just some free ride. So you see there's toxic, joy-ruining religion. In this case, it had a very Jewish flavor. Not, but oftentimes it doesn't. It can have a secular flavor. It can be like, oh, you don't think this? Oh, you don't contribute to this? Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. All right. 
So here, let's explore, take a minute, and I'd like us to explore the grace-joy connection. How God's grace connects us, leads us, is essential to joy. Four really important thoughts. Joy comes from oneness with God. That's where joy comes from. It comes from oneness with God. The life of God inside of us. That's the only way to have real happiness, to have real joy, is connection with God. We were made for it. Without a connection with God, life is a frustrating affair. Happiness always seems like right around the corner, but never really available to you. Joy comes from oneness with God. Here's the second thought. Joy cannot be earned, achieved, deserved, succeeded at because of this thing called sin. That's why none of the schemes to justify yourself work. They fail to account for your brokenness. Like all of us are are a little off. All of us, well, actually, all of us are a lot off. And we need, we desperately need to be fixed. So earning and achieving and deserving, it can never quite work. We try to work for and achieve joy, and no one does. It's like, and it's such a cliche for us. Like it's, like we all know this, and we still still keep falling into the same thing. I mean, we make movies about how, you know, oh man, you know, look at, he made all the money in the world and he was still unhappy. And that's why like our, our heroes, like our athletes, that like, we're like, dude, how cool would it be to be him, man? It would be so awesome to be that guy, to look great, to be able to, you know, play ball like him and everybody would think I'm, and be popular and be, have money that I could, couldn't spend in three generations. And then just, you know how it is, just time after time after time, you find out, man, they really are a broken person. Man, they really are unhappy. Some of them even take their own life. And you think, what? what? Right? Because it doesn't work. You can't earn, achieve, deserve, or succeed at joy because of sin. There's something broken that has, if you don't fix that, nothing else works. And you think, yeah, sin's not my problem, Ed. My problem is I, I can't pay the bills. Well, I, yeah, I get that's a problem, but yes, sin is your problem. Now, here's the thing. Ready? Careful. Sin is not, when the Bible is talking about this, we've come to think of that sin is breaking a commandment. Now, I don't think you should break commandments. That's not what I'm saying, but that's not what sin is. You break commandments because of sin, it's not like you break a commandment, therefore you have sin. Does that make sense? That's an actually very important sentence. There's uh, two Latin phrases, we, one that we throw around here all the time, and I'm going to teach you another one. We talk about constantly about Imago Dei from Genesis 1. If you're a journey person, you're going, if I know two Latin words, it's Imago and Dei, right? So because God, it's like the, the main and first thing that God says about humans. They are made in the image of God. That's why we have this thing where we, we have to be righteous. We have to feel justified. We have to feel like we're a good person because God made us to be exactly that. And it never works if you're, if you're not that, right? And so here's, here's though what, when the, when the humans were tempted in the garden, the devil, if assuming the serpent is the devil, the devil said to them, well, what, what's the deal here, Eve? And, and, you know, she's at the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. They're not supposed to, you know the story, right? Yes, more or less. And so, and she, he says, did God really say that you can't eat this? Or she goes, yeah, you, we can't eat that. We, we can't even touch the tree or the fruit. By the way, toxic religion already in there. God didn't say you couldn't touch it. They could touch it. They, they, could, they could build a tree house in that tree. They could carve their name. They could do a heart carve, an E plus A for ever or whatever. They could do whatever. They just couldn't eat the fruit. And she goes, well, here's what the devil says. She says, if we do that, we'll die. And the devil says, you're not going to die. What is death, anyways? He says, uh, 
Because God knows that in the day you eat of it, you're going to be smart like him. And then, ready? Here's your next Latin phrase. And he knows that you'll be saicut deus. Imago Dei, the devil says, you will be as gods. And most of us have been taught to think, yeah, that liar, the devil. Yeah, kind of. But in that case, he was telling the truth. Yeah, we will be as gods. That's the sentence. That's the consequence. You're now, okay, here you go. You get to be as God. That's why we judge each other, because we think we're God. We, that's why we put ourselves, that's why we keep thinking God's here to just make our plan work, because we think we're God's, right? That's the essence of what's wrong with us. That's manifested, ready, big sentence here, manifested in our constant drive to justify ourselves. One of the best movies you've never seen is this movie called Chariots of Fire. It's super old and stuff. But there's these two runners, and one's a Christ follower and one's not. And uh, they're running the 100 meters. And the one who's not a Christ follower, he says he's laying there the night, day before the race, and he's getting you know, a massage to get ready to get his muscles all loose. And he's talking, and he says, I have 10 seconds. 10 seconds to justify my existence. Here's the tragedy, right? He did win the gold medal, but you're still going to die unhappy, unjustified. And see, by doing this, by these attempts to justify yourself, we keep making the weird and wrong choices, and, and it's like the Lord of the Rings. You know, you remember, most of you have seen the movies, right? I don't want to spoil the plot here, but... Uh, it's a weird thing when you find out that Gollum used to be a hobbit. Because the ring is Saikut Deus, by the way. That's the point of the book. And it turned him into a monster. That's, that's what's happening to us. So Jesus said it like this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever is committing sin, you're a slave to sin, whether you know it or not. So let me show you what Paul says in Philippians real quick. So Paul says, you know, beware of, the, beware of these people. And he's, remember, their toxic religion had a Jewish flavor. He says, uh, he says this. He says, if anyone wants to play this game, if anyone has a desire to put confidence in the flesh. See, confidence in the flesh had to do, this is an adult room, right? It had to do with circumcision. Like I have confidence in something that was done to the flesh around my penis, right? Circumcision. I know he said penis. Hey. So it's like, okay, but could you, could you grow up a little bit? All right. You're like, yeah, I love this sermon now. <laughs> it's like, he says, well, you really want to play this. You really want to do this. He goes, let me tell you, here's, here's my story. He says, I, I'm circumcised the eighth day. Just like it says in the Bible. See, most of these Judaizers, they weren't born Jewish. They converted to Judaism. They were converts. Paul says, hey, when were you circumcised? Well, I was 28. Oh, okay. It says in the Bible you're supposed to do it when you're eight days old. I mean, that's all right. It's, you know, it's like whatever. Of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, um, yeah, and what tribe are you guys from again? Oh, you don't know? Oh, you don't have one? Well, I'm from Benjamin. That's the best one, by the way. The tri and really, they did think of it like that because it stayed loyal to David. Tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Hey, how's your Hebrew, guys? Well, you know, we're learning a few words here and there. He's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. I dream in Hebrew. So, uh, yeah, good for you. As to the law of Pharisee, you know, the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible, the language the Bible is written in, um, <clears throat> the Bible I have memorized like every word, which he did, by the way. All Pharisees did. Yeah. You want to play? They're great. It's kind of like that thing where, where like you talk to the, the rich, rich, rich guy who says, he says, you listen, I know you think that it would work if you just had enough money, but I, have, I got all the money and I'm still not happy. Paul's like the guy that says, listen, I took this, I took this, this train, this self-righteousness train, 
I wrote it to the end of the, the end of the line. I wrote it all the way to the end, and I'm telling you, it doesn't work. Paul's like the rich guy in righteousness who says, it didn't work. I was still joyless and sinful and not really justified. He says, so here's what I do, right? Here's the third thought on grace. Jesus saves us from our sin and offers us the righteousness of God as a gift. Isn't that funny? The thing we really need, the only way we can get it is as a gift. You can, there's this, you can see why humility is so huge in the, in the life with God. Because it takes humility to always be receiving gifts. And to always be, it's like if you have a friendship where people are, where your friends are always inviting you over and they're always picking up the tab and they, maybe they have a lot more money than you and they just go, listen, we want to go to a really nice place. And you're like, ooh, that's a little out of our budget right now. They go, oh, let's just go. And you feel like, man, shouldn't at least one time, see, God is like that. He says, just keep receiving. You're like, well, what about all these spiritual practices and stuff? All of those have one purpose, to position us to receive some more. That's why you have a quiet time. That's why you read the Bible. That's why you fast. That's why you, you can't earn stuff, right? We just learned that. So how do you get it? You receive it. Here's the, here's the trick. You have to abandon the earning deserving plan in order to receive. You got to let go of all the stuff you're holding on to. Paul's going to tell you that in a second. So here's the deal. Those who trust him get him and they get joy. That's our last grace thought. Put that up there. I think that's up there. Do we have that? No? There it is. Those who trust him, well, they get him. If you will trust Jesus, you get Jesus. And then you get joy. That's how it works. You can't work your way out of it. You got to simply receive him. And that's where joy comes. So every sermon's got to have a practical application, right? Here's, here's, here's the one. I'm going to read a little verse to you. Can I get the verse first and then the point? So Paul says in verse 7, this should be on the screen eventually. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, all that stuff that I gained by being Mr. Hebrew guy, Mr. Jewish guy, keep the law, like all that stuff. He says, all that stuff, all that was gained to me, now I just think of it as loss. I just try to make sure it doesn't get in my way. I count it as loss for the sake of getting Jesus. Because if I trust him, I get him. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, since you laughed at the word penis, um, the word rubbish there is the Greek word skubalon. Say skubalon. You know how, like, you know how when you're, especially when you're a kid, if you know like five Spanish words, what are they? They're all swear words, right? I mean, that's the first thing you learn in any language is what are the swear words? So here's your Greek swear word. It's skubalon, right? This is the word translated, this is from one uh, scholarly source. The word translated dung here was often used in Greek as a vulgar term for fecal matter. You're like, man, I love this. <laughs> yeah, we are having the junior high ministry in here next hour. So uh, as such, it would most likely have had a certain shock value for the readers. So Paul's using, he's not saying, you know, excrement or uh, poo-poo. He's using, I'll just let you fill in the word, Right. He's saying, I just think of it as so much, don't say it. <laughs> I know some of you actually said it just now. So I know all of you at home are saying, oh. And if your kids are watching, oh, so the pastor said I can say that word. So yes, I did. Go ahead. So no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, kids. Don't, don't say that. See, Paul's saying, here's the deal. It's like having a gangrene limb. You got to cut it off. You, you can't kind of do this. It doesn't work. You can't kind of go, yeah, Ed, yeah. But you know, just to be on the safe side. No, don't. You got to, here, so here's what you do. You have to decisively dump confidence in the flesh. That's application number one. 
You have to decisively dump confidence in the flesh. Yes, I know what I just said. Self-justifying, it'll creep in, so you got to be on your guard. Got to be on your guard. Keep receiving. Keep receiving. Let me give you one more passage and then we'll be done. Paul goes on to say this. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. Isn't that kind of nice to hear the guy that's writing the Bible say that? I think that's kind of cool. He says, dude, if you're looking for perfect, don't look here. But I, here's, here's what you do do. You press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He goes, here's my job. I just keep going towards Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not going to keep. I'm not going to keep looking at the score, seeing what the tally is. I'm just going to keep moving towards Jesus, brothers. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do: forgetting what lies behind, and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Number two: let God free you from the past. Let God free you from the past. The only way. The reason why humans can never succeed at the self-justifying project is that all of us have these bitter memories, these regrets, these things that you go, oh, why didn't I do this? Man, it's, oh, I screwed up everything. Oh, I've ruined my life. Oh. The only thing to be done with the past is to bring it to the cross of Jesus, to trust him. And I really don't know how to explain this other than that God is able to do magic. He's, there's a verse that says he's able to restore the years the locusts have eaten. Only God can do that. Only God can take the parts of your past that you just go, oh, I, I, oh, look at the damage I've done. God says, not only will I forgive you, but I will restore that. See, grace means that God forgives us, that it's bigger. There's this old song that you wouldn't like the song but it's got the, because it's like really a dr drudging old hymn, but it says, grace that is greater than all my sin. See, grace is joy. Like in the story of the prodigal son and the lost coin and the lost sheep, every one of those stories ends with God finding what he's looking for and people and everybody being joyful. God pursuing people is is joy. God, God is trying to find them and he's going, I'm going to wait till I get my hands on you because when I do, I'm going to fill you with joy. The joy of that, like my prayer every day, I, I, I pray for certain things and I pray for, uh, like when I get to my grandsons, I pray this verse, Psalm 32, over them that says, how happy are those whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Because I love them, right? And I want them to be happy. And I know, here's how people become happy, is they have their stuff released. And I want them to someday come to know that, right? So, I'm, uh, here's your story. So, I'm, uh, so I, I've uh, become friends with a guy in our church. And, uh, and there's, they had a, a uh, member of their family who was young, like, well, young from my standpoint, 50, he was 51, I believe, is that right? 51 or so. And he was dying of, of uh, cancer. And, uh, and it was this, this guy's new to journey and new to faith. And uh, this was right before he, they, God started turning that around. So he's uh, in his house by himself at night, and uh, just trying to get word that this, his family member, his name is Tommy, that he had just passed. 
and he's, of course, grief-stricken. And uh, he's, a, you know, a few beers into the grief. And, uh, and, you know, one of the sure things is the laws of the universe is beer in, beer out, right? I mean, that's just the way it's got to be. So he's saying, God, Tommy, are, are you okay? And as he's in the bathroom, it's a full moon, and so it looks like this. He sent me this, texting me this picture. It's really cool. So there's the moon that he took after this. But as he's standing there in the banyo, he looks out the bathroom window, and here's what he sees the next, that night. Look at how cool that is. And here's the thing. It's God saying to him, I got this. I got you. I'm pursuing you. See, the the most joyous thing in the world is God's pursuit of people, even if they don't deserve it. Even if if they weren't pursuing him. So here's here's what we should do is... Since God is pursuing us, what if we did this? What if we turned and pursued him? You could see how life might start working if you do that. How the joy might come back. So we're going to pray. So why don't you bow your head and close your eyes. You guys at home, just bow your head and close your eyes. Try to stay focused. And whatever you have in your lap, if you have your phone or an outline or pen or the remote control or whatever. Just, could you just set that somewhere right now so your hands are free? Just set your stuff aside and put your hands on your lap with the palms facing up. And just for a second, why don't you kind of uh, close your hands. You don't have to clench it or anything, but just close your hand so it looks like two fists on your legs. Go ahead and open your eyes and just notice your hands. And at, let God speak to you and show you what's, what's in there. What are you holding on to? What, what, what are you continuing to grip? What are there regrets? their habits from your past, their efforts to make yourself feel superior, to feel good. Oh, I'm a good person. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. You don't understand. For some of you, that's ruining your relationships. You need everybody to agree with you. You need everybody to understand what you're saying, and you're really frustrated because they don't seem to get it. Ready? On three, what if we all just let go of this, laid it at the foot of the cross, and let Jesus find us? What if we did that? How would life be if you didn't have to justify yourself? If you could just receive everything from the good hand of God. On three, ready? Ready to open your hand? One. For some of you, it's the compulsion that you have to make everything work out for everybody. Two. Here we go. Three. Just let it go. Okay, I'm going to speak this word over you. Whatever things were gained to you, those things you have considered as loss for the sake of having Christ. You count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, your Lord.
you may, you'll be found in him, not having a righteousness of your own that you came up with, but that which comes through his faithfulness. All right, and just pray this right now. Just whisper this to God. I receive the goodness and righteousness of Jesus and all the blessings that come with knowing him. In Christ's name I pray. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, next week uh, is our big weekend with Chris Gore. I can't wait for that. I can't wait to have you guys all here for us to be together, for us to be together whether you're at home or there. And first step is coming up after the next service. So go to Costco and buy something and then come back. And uh, if, you, if you need to sign up for first step, we'll just take you as a walk-in. God bless you guys. Have an amazing week. Bless you. Our prayer team is right over there, and they, thank you, and so they're ready to pray for breakthroughs and uh, pray God's goodness on you, so if, you're, if you need a healing, why wait till next week? Do it now, so almost forgot. Thank you.